Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Really appreciate it. Um, as you know, we're going to be providing an update today on the incident that happened in downtown yesterday, the stabbing. We will have uh, Mayor Ken Sim followed by Chief Adam Palmer here. Uh, we'll start with Mayor Ken Sim. Uh, he'll be saying a few remarks, followed by Chief Palmer, and then we'll open it up for question uh, period. Okay. So I'd now like to call up Mayor Sim. It's going to be interesting. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. And before I get started, I would like to acknowledge that we are hosting today's press conference on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I do want to thank them for their generosity and their hospitality and the love and care they show this land that we get to live, work, and play on. Now, um, over, over the past few days, we've seen a series of troubling incidents. And so to the victims of the recent incidents, I just want to let you know that our hearts and our thoughts are with you and to the people of Vancouver. I also uh, want to let you know on behalf of council and myself that we understand your anxiety and your concern. Uh, know that the VPD will not rest until the perpetrators um, of all these incidents are off the street. And to be very clear, Every person who calls Vancouver home, uh, visits our city, or who simply wants to enjoy our public safe uh, spaces deserves to feel safe and secure. Uh, whether you're enjoying our parks, walking down the street, or grabbing a cup of coffee at one of our cafes, the safety of Vancouverites and tourists and visitors is non-negotiable. I do wanna stress that despite the gravity of a couple of the recent incidents in our city. I'm relieved thanks to the, uh, the swift response of the VPD and our uh, emergency services. There were no fatalities when there easily uh, could have been some. And as I said, uh, public safety is non-negotiable. And that's why we've made historic investments into the Vancouver Police Department including the addition of 100 new police officers that's led to safer schools, increased officer presence across the city, and quicker response times. We've begun and we will continue to expand the mental health units that work hand in hand with VPD on the streets and in the command center triaging calls. Now, even with the significant number of proactive uh, actions taken, it's important that we acknowledge the gaps in our public safety approach um, that continue, um, or a, a lot of these uh, gaps are at a non-municipal level. And uh, my office, our councillors, we've been in close contact with Minister Farnsworth and the Premier's office and uh, let me just tell you, they share our commitment to enhancing public safety. The reality is, though, that Vancouver continues to grapple with a mental health crisis that requires an all-hands-on-deck approach, including the federal government, because this is something that we can't just simply arrest our way out of. And I do want to acknowledge that the Premier and the Attorney General have been pushing the federal government to change the criminal code to address uh, what we're facing, not only in Vancouver, but uh, in the region and in the province. Now, um, we owe it to all Vancouverites and yes, to uh, the VPD officers and other officers throughout the region and the province who put their lives on the line every single day to keep us safe. We need to give them effective tools to address the challenges that we face today. Uh, the reality is people are falling through cracks in the system. And I say this respectfully, there are people on the streets that should be in treatment, they should be in recovery, in, uh, in recovery, and in some cases they should be in jail. And I wanna leave you with this, more can be done and more has to be done. But thanks to the incredible efforts of our VPD, Vancouver 
despite our challenges, is still a very safe city. Stranger attacks are down, and there are more officers on our streets than ever before. And I want to thank everyone who's been working on these cases and the thousands of officers throughout the region who go about their duties every single day with little or no fanfare, and they keep our streets safe so we can live the lives that we do. And so with that, um, I'd just like to say thank you for your service. And I'm now going to pass it over to the chief uh, to make some comments. Thank you, Mayor Sim. Good afternoon, everybody. So there's three things I'm going to update you on today. Three completely unrelated issues happening in the city. The first one, of course, is going to be the incident that happened yesterday in the downtown core of the city, which actually encapsulates about five separate incidents that all resulted in the arrest of this uh, person. That will be one thing I'm gonna to talk to you about separately. I'm gonna to talk to you about another incident that occurred at Clark and Hastings around the same time, but another part of the city not related whatsoever to the uh, incident in the downtown core. And then thirdly, I'm gonna give you a bit of an update on the Stanley Park sexual assault investigation. So my comments will be somewhat lengthy as I cover all of those off. Today, I am here to provide you with an update on the frightening series of unprovoked attacks that occurred yesterday morning in the downtown core. They were very public incidents that have attracted a lot of media and public attention. It was around noon, it was a Wednesday afternoon, downtown Vancouver, and as you can imagine, lots of people around, out and about, on the streets on a nice day. These attacks have understandably led to much discussion about crime and safety in our community. And I want to acknowledge the concern and fear that some people may have. I also want to commend the brave actions of the Vancouver police officers who were on scene very quickly after the 911 calls. These officers provided aid and comfort to the injured victim and also placed themselves in significant danger to arrest an armed suspect. Investigators from our major crime section have worked for the past 24 hours to collect evidence to piece together the suspect's movements prior to his arrest yesterday. Our investigative team has also learned more about the background of the person that we have arrested. What we're learning is concerning, and I'm going to tell you about it now. I would also like to acknowledge that uh, I am joined today by Deputy Chief Howard Chow, who is in charge of our, our uh, operations division. His officers were the officers on scene that dealt with the suspect on location. And Deputy Chief Fiona Wilson, who is in charge of our investigation division. And her major crime detectives have conduct of the investigation. So to give you an overview of the main incident I want to talk about today. So yesterday, Wednesday, March 20th, 11.53 a.m., Vancouver police officers responded to several 911 calls reporting that a person had been stabbed near the intersection of Smythe and Canby Streets and that a man was chasing people around with a knife. Multiple officers responded immediately and located the victim, a 61-year-old man who had been stabbed and was seriously injured. As officers tended to the victim, other officers flooded the area, searched for and located the suspect and took him into custody. The arrest was made within minutes of the 911 call. A taser was deployed on the suspect during the arrest. The victim has received treatment in hospital, and we hope that he will recover fully from his physical injuries. However, the emotional trauma will likely remain for a long time. I just want to reiterate that the victim and the suspect in this case are total strangers. They have no prior relationship with one another, and that my thoughts are with the victim and his family. The suspect in this case is a 46-year-old man who is known to police and appears to have mental health challenges. Though he has a history with police, we have not had significant dealings with him here in Vancouver. We believe he has previously spent time in Surrey and Delta after returning to Canada from Thailand in 2022, where he spent time in custody overseas for multiple offenses, including breaking into a bank, causing damage inside of that premises and overstaying his tourist visa. Six days ago, on March 15th, the suspect was released from Fraser Regional Correctional Center on probation after serving a jail sentence for uttering threats against his own family members and also against prominent federal politicians. The suspect failed to report to his probation officer yesterday morning in Surrey which is where he is reporting, again, outside the city of Vancouver, 
And these incidents began to occur yesterday in downtown Vancouver um, while he was absent from reporting to his probation officer in Surrey. Now, there are a number of secondary incidents connected to this, so I'm going to put a little bit of a timeline together for you and sort of map out how this played out in the morning. Though our investigation is ongoing, we now believe that this same man is responsible for five separate violent and unprovoked incidents that unfolded in downtown Vancouver throughout the morning yesterday. The first assault occurred at 8.40 a.m. when a man was attacked by a stranger while walking near Seymour and West Cordova streets. Minutes later, a 911 caller reported that a man had entered a coffee shop near Harbor Center. There was a disturbance causing a glass window to be broken and making customers fear for their safety. The third incident occurred at about 11.25 a.m. A man was walking near Main and Prior Streets and was chased by a stranger who lunged at him with a knife and was yelling at him. The victim managed to run away from the attacker. And then the main incident, as I mentioned, at 11.53, our officers took custody of the suspect on Canby Street. Shortly after he was arrested, we learned that the suspect was involved in an additional assault, which is still under investigation. So far at this point, Kent Meads, M-E-A-D-E-S, 46 years of age, has now been charged with assault with a weapon, assault, uttering threats. He is in custody, and I expect that more charges will be laid as the investigation unfolds. These are extremely serious crimes, and nobody should downplay the impact that they have on our community. Everybody should feel safe when they go out to a coffee shop or they head out for a walk on their lunch break in downtown Vancouver. And the actions of this one man yesterday have left many in community questioning their sense of safety in our city. Incidents like the one that happened yesterday are disturbing, but I can assure you that despite these challenges, Vancouver is a safe city. As we've emerged from COVID-19 and normal life has returned, we've seen the frequency of unprovoked stranger assaults decline by about 77%. The Vancouver Crime Severity Index, which many of you know, is a weighted uh, measure that compares the severity of all criminal incidents occurring in major cities and communities across Canada. And in Vancouver, that has actually decreased by 16.1% over the last five years, whereas in Canada overall, it has gone up and increased. We've also seen a decrease in 2024 on the number of serious assaults occurring in our city. Support from Vancouver Coastal Health has resulted in improved and more efficient treatment for people with serious mental health issues, many of whom previously had fallen through the cracks, suffered, and came into more frequent contact with the police throughout the pandemic. Mayor Sim's commitment and the City Council's commitment to properly fund the Vancouver Police Department, including the addition of 100 new officers and mental health professionals, has given us more tools to combat crime and address important public safety issues, including more patrol officers on the front lines, our metro units, which are additional nimble resources we can deploy throughout the city, additional officers, to supplement our mental health unit and also additional officers in our major crime section. And while we're never going to completely eliminate violent crime, our rapid response and immediate arrest of the suspect following yesterday's stabbing shows the effectiveness and efficiency of a properly staffed police department. But we do still have ongoing concerns about uh, people with at the serious end of the spectrum with mental health issues in our community that could be a risk to public safety and also ongoing discussions about bail reform. One thing I do want to say on this particular incident that I just mentioned and the sub-incidents that, that uh, accompany this, this major investigation is that we are looking for additional witnesses, any additional victims. We think it's possible that other people may have encountered this fellow and uh, perhaps are victims of crime or any bystanders or uh, dash cam video, anything that anybody may have that they saw, they witnessed, they filmed on their phone, we need you to please call 604-717-2541. That's 604-717-2541. Before we take questions, I do want to give you an update on the two other incidents that I mentioned that have occurred in Vancouver this week and have resulted in uh, you know, further media inquiries and discussions. The Stanley Park stranger attack sexual assault investigation. 
We are still gathering evidence and working towards the identification of the person responsible for what we believe was a sexually motivated stranger attack on a woman in Stanley Park on the morning of Monday, March the 18th. We continue to have increased police presence in and around Stanley Park on um, bicycle, foot patrols, vehicles, and our mounted unit on horseback. We have specialized sex crimes investigators, forensic experts, and crime analysts assigned full-time who are reviewing the facts and working with police from other jurisdictions to help identify this suspect. There is still much that we can't say due to the sensitive nature of this investigation, but I can tell you that the suspect is described as a black or dark-skinned male in his 20s, about five foot seven, wearing a dark toque, a running jacket, dark pants, and is described as clean shaven. I know that there were some people, some media inquiries were made about the arrest of a suspect. I will tell you that um, a person was taken in for questioning who is a known sex offender. However, that has not led to um, any evidence to show that he was the person responsible for this incident. So this is a very active investigation and we still need to identify the suspect in this serious file. Again, with this file, similar to the previous one, but there is a different phone number to call. We need witnesses, anybody with video, or anybody that may have any information to please call VPD investigators at 604-717-4021. That's 604-717-4021. The final incident, the third incident I want to update you on, which is completely unrelated to the previous ones I've spoken about, occurred yesterday at Clark and Hastings Street in East Vancouver. This occurred at the intersection of Clark and Hastings on the Northwest corner. And I wanna mention this one because um, there is some video that's out there, some dash cam video that a citizen has provided to some media outlets. So I know that some of the media have it. It is out on social media as well. To me, it's, it's what I would call a bit of a bone chilling video um, showing um, some of the real stressors and challenging and dangerous situations that our officers face every day in this city. So yesterday, March 20th, at around 11.30 in the morning. So this was about 23 minutes before the call that happened in the downtown core. Totally unrelated, but the timing was right around the same time. Multiple people called 911 reporting that a man was waving a knife around near the corner of Clark and Hastings in East Van. VPD officers responded when they arrived at the scene, a man stepped out onto the street with a knife in his hand approached the officers aggressively and refused commands to drop the knife. Multiple rounds from a less lethal beanbag shotgun were deployed to stop the suspect as well as a taser. None of the officers were injured. The suspect was taken to hospital for precaution due to being struck with multiple beanbag rounds by police. Abel Fazi Amini, that's A-B-O-L-F-A-Z-I, surname is A-M-I-N-I, -I, 36 years of age, has been charged with weapons and assault offenses, and he is currently in custody. Those are my comments, and myself and the mayor are happy to take questions. Uh, mayor Sam, you and the chief both insist that Vancouver is a safe city and that random attacks are down, when in fact that too happened in the last seven days. And when we went back to those crime scenes the day after, we did not see any police presence. So, you know, with the Stanley Park assailants still out there, how can you convince the people of Vancouver that they're not going to be next? Yeah, well, I, I can um, get the chief to uh, elaborate in greater detail, but I, I just want to be very clear. Uh, we can talk about how crime like Vancouver is a safer city and it's getting safer. And let's acknowledge it doesn't really mean much for people that are victims of crime. So I just want to get that out there right now. We're, you know, empathetically, we understand what people go through and the fear that it can cause in uh, some circles. Look, we're a big city. That's just the reality. And uh, Vancouver is growing uh, by the day, and these are big city challenges. And so um, there will be incidents like this now and in the future. And it's, uh, it, it's been a big focus of our administration, um, you know, to make a significant investment in the tools that we can invest in as a city. And so what, what did we do? Well, we made a commitment uh, to properly funding the Vancouver Police Department for the first time in 15 years. We uh, um, you know, made a push to hire 100 
new police officers, body-worn cameras, school liaison officer program, um, and making the investments in improving budgets so the VPD can work on a lot of proactive uh, initiatives that uh, you know you don't see behind, um, like uh, in the public, but like all the hard work that they, uh, you know, the training they go through um, to de-escalate and deal with situations before they become situations. Or you look at, look at what happened at Lord Bing High School when there was a report of someone walking around with uh, a gun. That's a super hot situation. Um, and as a parent, I, I'd be totally terrified if my kids were at that school and our officers, our members at VPD did, did an amazing job reacting to that situation um, and everyone was safe. And so uh, all I got to say is, look, we're a big city. There will be challenges. But when you look at the macro data, um, there are a lot of cases where, you know, you, when you look at the data, you know, uh, you know, it, it is becoming a safer city. Adam. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I would just like to add a little bit of uh, context and perspective on that. So it's a good question. And I think it's a, you know, a natural question that you would ask. Um, it is important to note, though, as I mentioned, when we're looking at crime overall, the, the data is very clear that over the last five years, the crime severity and index in Vancouver has uh, reduced by 16.1%, whereas the crime severity index in Canada over that same period has gone up by 6.1%. And also when we're talking about violent crime, uh, violent, uh, serious violent crimes and assaults, year to date in 2024, it's actually down 14% across the city. It's important to remember though that every day in Vancouver, VPD officers are responding to about 700 calls for service. So even while we're here, doing this press conference, there's gonna be you know, a dozen, two dozen calls coming in. Like, it's just continuous, it never stops. Like officers are going all over the city, lights and siren responding to calls, and that's life in a big city. It's not, you know, not, not a small town, and we are the regional core for the whole you know, Metro Vancouver area. So there will be more draw into the big city. As to your question about why you wouldn't see more officers down at Smythe and Beatty, the reason is because there's no need to. That was a particular incident that happened in that area. That's not a bad area. And the suspect that was responsible for that is now in custody and jail. So there's not a need to put a whole bunch of officers in an area where there's no you know, further crime threat right in that neighborhood. Chief, when you talk to the residents in the area, yes. I mean, these numbers and stats, it just blows over them. They do, talking does. about innocent people going about their business. Yes, the numbers are down, but we're still talking about roughly two stranger attacks a day on people. <clears throat> that is my phone, I apologize. Um, two stranger attacks on people a day, innocent members of the public. Mm -hmm. They want to know why is a suspect with the kind of history he has why is he out on the street if he poses a risk to the public? Yeah, those are good questions. So here's my response, Ramina. Number one, you're right. It is concerning for the public. And the, the general public does not know crime stats. They don't pay attention to them. Like, why would you? It's not in your normal course of you know activity going about your day. People just know how they feel when they walk down the street or when they hear you know a major incident happening in communities. So I understand that it's concerning. And these incidents are concerning for us. The number, you're right, we still have around two a day, so it's a lot. It's not what we want to have, but we have reduced it uh, significantly. We've cut it by more than half because we have done projects and put extra resources into it and because we're intelligence-led and we're going after people we know that are chronic offenders, people that we know have a propensity to do that kind of crime. So that is something that we do. That's part of our job and that we're responsible for. But as to your issue about you know different people walking around in community that may have um, mental health issues, people that maybe have committed crimes and they're out. Some of that stuff you have to realize is not the sole responsibility of the police. So, you know, holding somebody in custody, that is up to Crown Council and the judicial system to hold somebody in custody. We recommend people to be held in custody all the time, but there's many incidents where people are released and that is out of our hands even though we would like to see them in custody. For example, this fellow that we just arrested, Mr. Meads, we have made a strong case for him to be remanded in custody, and we expect that he will be, but ultimately that decision is not the decision of the police. Just like if somebody is picked up for severe mental health issues, and you know, I just wanna be clear that I don't wanna villainize people that have mental health issues, because 20% of Canadians will have mental health issues in their life, and there will be people in this room among us that have had mental health issues in their life 
They will never have any interactions with the police whatsoever. And there's a segment of the population that, you know, we want to see get help and that are in a tough place and we want them to get help from mental health professionals. But there's also a segment at the extreme end, which are the ones that we will quite often deal with that are scary people and should be probably institutionalized either in some kind of a psychiatric facility or a prison and society should be protected from them. So we're dealing with that small group at the high end of the scale. But where's the gap there then? We understand what your role is as police, right? You're, you're making the arrests, but then there's this Grand Canyon size gap between the arrest, what happens in court, you're back out on the street, new offenses occur, right. meanwhile innocent people are getting hurt, seriously injured. Yeah. Well, I think the gap comes, you know, a lot of the stuff we just talked about. So bail reform is an issue all across Canada. And I'll say it's actually a, an issue that comes up North American wide amongst police services and, um, you know, different prosecutorial services and government in all provinces. There has been some movement on that by the, the province of BC to improve that. So we are working with them. We do bring the concerns to the province. That is their area of responsibility. And we have seen some positive action there. And the mental health side as well, like sometimes people are released that we feel should be held in custody or require additional help. I, and again, I want to just be clear, it's really people at the extreme end of the scale. It's not the vast majority of people that may be suffering from mental health issues. And I do also want to say that Vancouver Coastal Health have been amazing partners. And I don't want to point any fingers at them because they've been amazing to work with. And we've got so many partnership cars and great programs in place that we've actually, for the cohorts of people um, that do have common interactions with police and healthcare, we've got so many proactive programs in place now that for those individuals identified, we've reduced police calls for service with those cohorts by over 50% and hospital visits by over 60%. So it does work, but there's gonna be people that will come into Vancouver like this fellow yesterday, for example, uh, in the downtown core that we don't have a lot of history on. He spent time overseas. He is a Canadian, he's a BC guy, spent time overseas, got into some trouble there, came back, to the Metro Vancouver area, but he was living out in the suburbs. He wasn't somebody we would normally interact with in Vancouver. So that creates challenges when you've got a huge region of over 3 million people, and we've got a police service here for 725,000 people, but having the huge influx of people from all over the region. So he wasn't high on our radar because we normally don't deal with them. It's more in the suburbs they're dealing with them. Chief Palmer, Chief, I want to ask you about the incident at Clark and Hastings. Yeah. What have you learned so far about what was going to that person's had before the interaction that he had with police. I imagine it might have been a mental health issue there. And I'd right. also post to Mayor Sim, hard to ignore that you campaigned on adding a hundred more police officers, but the mental health nurses, right? What about those on the nurses? Like where where is that at? So what I will say about the fellow at um, Clark and Hastings, that person does not have um, any kind of dealings with the police of any significance. He's not somebody that is, he's definitely not somebody on our radar at all. Um, very few dealings, you know, at all with police anywhere. So he's not somebody that's on our radar, um, more, um, you know, peripheral type stuff. However, um, there are some mental health issues at play, not in Vancouver, but in another jurisdiction um, in Metro Vancouver. With that fellow? Yes. Chief Palmer, uh, was Meads uh, on any substances at the time of his arrest yesterday? I don't know that. I don't know. That. I don't um, know. Also noticed that uh, during the arrest, I saw his hands were covered in paper bags. Can you explain what that was all about? Yeah, that's a standard technique we do to preserve evidence. So when somebody's handcuffed, obviously for their safety and the public safety, um, when we arrest the person, there may be evidence on their hands such as blood, DNA evidence. So we put that on there to preserve that evidence. So our forensic investigators can obtain that evidence before like he washes his hands or anything like that. And I have one for Sim. Yeah, sure. uh, what's your specific ask of the federal government. You, you mentioned that you're looking for support, but what is your specific ask from the federal government? Well, yeah, like um, as the chief mentioned, you know, bail reform. There, there, are a lot, there's a revolving door of, you know, call it catch and release. There, there are things that, you know, we we provide tools to the Vancouver Police Department, and they work incredibly hard um, to make our streets safe. And then, you know, people are released into the streets, and so that's challenging. And I think we have to acknowledge that if that uh, if that situation persists, we're really wasting a lot of time here. 
um, and we'll continue to have more of these incidents. And to answer your question, um, yeah, we still have some work to do on hiring the mental health uh, um, workers. But uh, uh, and I, I do want to share two examples. One, uh, I was actually uh, on a car 8788 uh, ride along about four months ago, um, and we provided resources to that. And I can tell you um, the, the mental health nurse working with the two police officers, how they de-escalated the situation and got someone who was experiencing a mental health uh, uh, crisis. Um, directed proactively to our healthcare system. Um, it was quite amazing. And secondly, while we haven't hit the number of the hiring numbers yet, uh, let's talk about effectiveness. We do have uh, a person in the command center triaging calls, and I forget the number, I think um, a chief, you would probably have them, but we've rerouted a lot of calls that shouldn't be, which would have been, um, you know, police calls, let's say, and maybe not the right um, response and we've triaged them to, um, you know, a better, uh, you know, um, outcome, so to speak. But Adam, sorry, Chief, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. So like in that continuum of services that we have for people that are, you know, de dealing with mental health issues in community, there are so many things we have in place right now. And I know that it's always a topic of discussion about how police interact with people that are suffering from mental health. But the continuum now of, you know, the mode teams, which don't involve police, which are out there, dealing with people in community without any police. And then we have the partnership teams that do reactive response to calls and the partnership teams that do proactive response to help people before they come into contact with police or the, or the um, healthcare system. So we've got those in place. We've got information sharing agreements with healthcare so that we can share data to make sure we're going after the right people to assist them. We've got um, in calls like this, um, when these are coming into our e-comm center and then also to our operational command center, we have a psych nurse now that's working there that is looking at all the calls coming in. These are experienced mental health professionals that can make a determination. And there's about, Howard, what is it, about eight calls a day that are being diverted, something like that, in that neighborhood. They look at many more than that, but about eight per day that they divert out of about the 700 calls that we receive that say, no, you know, this is one where you don't need to send the police. We can send, you know, alternate means of response or an alternate way of dealing with it. But these two calls that I just mentioned to you really highlight that there are going to be some calls where mental health is at play, both the one in the downtown core and the one at Clark and Hastings, that you absolutely need police to respond to because these are violent, dangerous people out on the street and you cannot send a psychiatric nurse or a, a social worker with a clipboard to deal with somebody that's waving around a knife and that requires a police response. So it's having the right solution to the situation that you're dealing with. And we have that continuum of service now in Vancouver. Yes, you, yes, you. Um, yep. The founder of Western Canada's leading live entertainment company has labeled the city of Vancouver as a no fun city with no culture. Uh, that's after the festival at New Brighton Park was given the green light more than a year ago. Uh, but they say that the city or, and the park board has come back and rejected it with three months notice. What are your, uh, what's your response to these comments? Yeah, we have to do work on making Vancouver a fun city. And that's really a park board question. Um, they have jurisdiction. You know, it was park board that approved it. And um, it's park board that has to ask themselves the questions. Why, why did they approve it? Were there other jurisdictions that, you know, um, you know, weren't consulted? So but that's really up to Park Board to answer that question. Are you happy about his commentary of your city being no fun and having no culture? I, I do think there are pockets, a lot of pockets of fun, and there are a lot of pockets of culture. But yeah, let's hit that one head on. There's, uh, there's work to be done, and so. You know, uh, we'll do at City Council, uh, we'll do everything uh, in our control to uh, promote, um, you know, fun in the city, be it, you know, uh, what we do with the responsible consumption of alcohol in certain areas, getting permits faster, um, you know, and supporting uh, live events where we can, uh, amongst other things. Great. Chief, I had a question for you. Sure. Uh, you mentioned in the case uh, involving Mr. Meads, you said, Appears to be a factor. Can mm -hmm. you elaborate on what appears mean? Yeah, so 
I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not a doctor, but based on uh, what we observed yesterday and based on feedback, I'm hearing from our officers that did respond that there appears to be mental health issues at play. So I can't give you like a clinical diagnosis, but that's the sense that people are getting from dealing with this man. And do you know why he was um, so he did serve time at um, Fraser Regional Correctional Center, was released on the 15th and was going into a period of probation. But as far as, you know, why released and timing and what he was in for, I think you'll have to follow up with corrections on that. I think there's no other questions. We'll end it here. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Thank, Thank you, everybody, you. for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.